Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Eric Barucha. I am Director of Bharti Vidya Peet Institute of Environment, Education and Research in Pune. This module is about the biogeographic zones of India. It is part of the environment and society paper that uh, is there in your course. The learning objectives are uh, for us to understand what are the biogeographic zones of India? Why is India a mega diversity nation? What are the specific biodiversity features of each zone that we have in our country? What are the natural and cultural landscape features? And in summary, what are the linkage of these biogeographic zones to the people of India? Uh, India is a mega diversity country. And uh, this is very fascinating because it is a very, very interesting country in terms of its biological diversity. India has 7 to 8 percent of the world's species of plants and animals in only 2.4 percent of the world's terrestrial ecosystems. Yeah, India is therefore within the first 17 mega diverse countries in the world today. So the session is going to tell you what is biodiversity. Biodiversity is really the variety of life on earth. It deals with species, wild plants, wild animals, but also domestic crops and livestock. And it deals with ecosystems and natural landscapes and the cultural landscapes which human beings have created over time, both rural and urban. We also are concerned with genetic diversity within each species, wild, domestic, cultivated crops, livestock breeds, and of course, us humans as well. Biodiversity is related to very ancient evolutionary processes. They are based on the abiotic or non-living parts of the world. And therefore, evolution was able to create nearly 1.8 billion species. The transitions from natural to cultural landscapes has taken a very, very long period of time. And this has happened due to our human influences. And therefore, within our own country, we have 10 distinct biogeographic zones. These zones were first talked about by H.S. Pawar and W.A. Rogers of Wildlife Institute of India, who talked about zones being based on flora, fauna, geography, climate, and so on. And so we have 10 major biogeographic zones in our country. Trans Himalayas in Tibet. Then we have the whole Himalayan tract. We have the desert belt. We have semi-arid regions of India. And we have the bio-rich Western Ghats, the Deccan Peninsula, which is the largest zone in our country. We have the Indo-Gangetic Plains. We have coastal areas. And we have this very special northeastern states. And, of course, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. But within these 10 zones have been divided further into 27 sub-zones or provinces. The first zone that we would like to talk about today is the Trans Himalaya. This is found in Ladakh and the Tibetan Plateau. It's a cold desert. It has alpine pastures, perennial snows, grasslands, very high altitude grasslands, and even high altitude lakes. So this zone is between 4,500 to 6,000 meters above sea level. The natural landscape that we have is alpine scrubland, and we have this huge diversity of wildlife within this area, wild sheep and goats, kiang, which is the, which is the wild ass there. We have snow leopards, marmots, some very rare birds like the black neck crane. We also have this cultural landscape, which is transhuman migratory shepherds. And these, these people move seasonally up and down the mountain slopes uh, every year, according to the season, in search of pasture belts. The subsistence agriculturists there has been also traditionally creating a certain amount of agriculture at a very, very baseline level. The, uh, the, the trans Himalayan belt is something that is very, very special. Uh, it's a zone which then goes into Tibet, and therefore much of the biodiversity is related to the flora and fauna which is across the border. This is important for us to understand because much of this interrelationship which happens is something which has been cut off because of political reasons today. The other part of it is that the desert flora that you get there is consists of a large 
variety of plant species which grow on the ground, which are dependent on what is happening today with climate change. So as climate change occurs, uh, many of these plant uh, species are likely to get very badly affected. The other part of this is what is happening to the glaciers in these belts. And the glaciers would therefore uh, melt and uh, the snows, the perennial snows would melt and climate change would therefore have very serious repercussions on the biodiversity of this area. The first signs of this has been the sudden disappearance in the last few years of amphibia of this cold region. And this is something that we need to consider as indicators of what climate change can do to a biogeographic region. The Himalayan zone is found in Jammu and Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Sikkim, Arunachal. And this is the northern belt of India, which is the mountainous belt. And within this mountainous belt, mountainous belt there are the western, central and eastern Himalayas, which have different biogeographic entities. The mountain ranges and river valleys therefore consist of a very large variety of what is happening in the ground. The natural landscape of the flora is coniferous forest, broadleaf forest, they have high altitude grassland or pastures, and there are the forest types which are based on pine, oak, rhododendron, and as we go further northeast, we get this whole belt of evergreen forest, very, very bio-rich. If you look at the fauna, it again has seven species of wild sheep and goats. It has the snow leopard, very elusive. And we have sambar and chital and tiger. The terrace farming and grazing lands are river valley projects, have river valley projects today, which has changed the landscape enormously. And we have rural settlements. Conservation here has happened through the Chipko movement. The Himalayas are a zone where people from India traditionally talked about the rishis and uh, for many many years a foreigner would never be allowed to go there because it was considered so sacred and one of the sacredness of these Himalayan peaks shows up in the way people have also preserved wildlife in those areas. So this is something which we sometimes don't get links to but these are very strong linkages. They are spiritual linkages of the Himalayas which people today uh, even today value. The other part of the Himalayan belt is how changes which are happening in the Himalayas, deforestation, is causing enormous er uh, erosion and with that flooding downstream of rivers. So the whole change that is occurring there is something that we need to consider because these are very special, very fragile areas. Zone 3 is India's desert found in Rajasthan and Gujarat and the Thar Desert is a very specialized ecosystem. It is an arid zone, it has very minimal sporadic rainfall and some years it doesn't rain there at all in most parts of the Thar. The natural landscape therefore is sand dunes, there are thorn forests and there are grassland belts. These semi-arid grasslands have their own complement of species. The flora is xerophytic, they have grasses and shrublands and the fauna consists of black buck, chinkara, these are the two uh, antelope-like species in our country, and a very, very endangered bird, the great Indian bustard. But we also have very common species like the dilgai. The rare species are the wolf and the desert cat. And very unfortunately, one of the only mammal species we have lost in this country comes from this region, which is India's cheetah. And the cheetah has not been seen now for nearly 100 years. The cultural landscape is grazing land. And uh, it's sometimes difficult for us to understand how such a desert area can support such large herds of cattle. But that's because the cattle herder actually moves from one area which has got grassland to another every year. They have a lot of traditional water harvesting strategies. And this is something which has changed the desert. The problem is with the recent very rapid change due to canal irrigation, which has converted this very bio-rich, very specific desert landscape into agricultural land. Uh, the desert regions are, again, very special. Changes in the desert region 
can annihilate many, many species much more rapidly than in other areas because the change in terms of what is happening in the ecology of the desert region is much more drastic than in many other more robust systems. So it is a very, very fragile area and sometimes we just think of it as being desert, but it's actually a very rich floral and faunal place which has a large number of endemic species. The traditional way in which this was handled as for water management is very different from what has happened today. And that is the impact that has happened due to the more recent changes that have happened in the desert. The fourth zone is the semi-arid part of Rajasthan, Gujarat, Punjab. And this is again a very low rainfall belt. The natural landscape here is thorn forest, very like the savannas that you could probably see in Africa. And the xerophytic vegetation there again supports very large numbers of species of plants and animals. A bubble forest is one specific type in this region. The fauna would be very similar in some ways to the desert fauna. It's black buck, chinkara, nilgai, again the great Indian mustard, the florican, and the wolf, jackal, fox, and one of the species in the southern part of this, in the run of Kutch, is the Indian lion, which is found only now in the gear area. Now, this is a problem because species which are found in only one protected area or sanctuary can become extinct due to various accidental regions. So this is something that we that need to look at. The cultural landscape is rain-fed farmland. It has wheat, maize, bajra, jawar, which are our crops from there. The cattle herders are maldaris. They have a large complement of buffaloes. And the traditional conservation measures there, which is very celebrated, is from this small sect of people called the Bishnoi. And I'm sure you have heard about these Bishnois uh, in the past. Uh, the semi-arid zone is an area where a lot of people have done a lot of work in the recent past on, on semi-arid fauna and flora. And this is something that we again need to understand if climate change is going to actually convert these semi-arid areas into desert. When that happens, you will have larger and larger desertif desertified areas in our country. And we need to understand how to deal with that today. The Bishna sect are a group of people who live in Rajasthan. They have small uh, wheat farms and bajra and jawar farms. And they have traditionally, over the last 200 years, preserved their fauna and flora in, in and around their villages. This is a very, very strong uh, feeling that they have. And they would do anything to protect their black buck, protect their chikara. They will see that those animals get water in drought areas. They will actually find ways to even chase out or even apprehend people who kill for now there. And I'm sure all of you know about this story. The next zone uh, is a very special zone. This is the Western Ghats. It is found from the southern parts of Gujarat into Maharashtra, Goa, Karnataka, down into Kerala. And these are evergreen forests, very much fragmented now because of human activity, becoming smaller and smaller patches of forest. And these have high diversity of plant life, climbers, shrubs, round flora, orchids, and a very special part of uh, this kind of vegetation occurs on the plateau tops that we have there, which are monsoonal plants, very, very specialized, very, very endemic to these areas, not found anywhere else in the world. The importance of this is that this Western Ghats is considered a global hotspot of biodiversity. And though we have a chain of protected areas, national parks and sanctuaries within this, the intervening areas are very badly impacted by human activity. So the cultural landscape is again very fascinating. It has hill slopes of shifting agriculture. Locally in Maharashtra, for example, we call it Rab. These are the upper hill slopes where they grow hill rice and other millets. Uh, the paddy lands are in the floodplains. And this is terraced land, which is again the area where a lot of traditional varieties of rice have, have been grown for, for generations. The interesting conservation angle for this 
is our sacred groves. These sacred groves have been looked after by Madho Kolis and Maratha farmers, and they are small pockets of very precious forest with gigantic trees and a uh, huge amount of uh, varied flora and fauna. So this is something which is very, very wonderful because this is traditional conservation at its best. Conservation of sacred groves through these religious sentiments has been there because people there believe in, believe in their animistic uh, gods and goddesses. And uh, this is what has managed to keep these sacred groves alive through many, many generations. Western Ghats is very biorich, but its biorichness now is very fragmented. And therefore, it's very important to look for small areas in the Western Ghats, in this biorich zone, which are very special, which have been protected sometimes by tradition. And those are the areas which we can build into a network of small areas by using what we now refer to as the Biodiversity Act of 2002 where local people can be incentivized to try and save these very small areas which are very special within the Western Ghats. The largest zone uh, in our country, the sixth zone, is the Deccan Peninsula. This has got multiple provinces within them, according to Rajas and Pawar, and they're therefore divided into these many, many sub-zones. It has a moderate sort of monsoonal climate across the zone as a whole, but much of it can also be very, very arid, like in the Deccan Plateau itself. The natural vegetation consists of patchy forests. The western would be normally teak. The more eastern would be normally sal forest. And a very special zone in this is the central highlands around the uh, Tapi and Narmada rivers, which again is a very different type of biotope. And this is very fascinating because the earliest work in our country on, on fauna was very often done from this belt. And so we know it very well for more than 150 years. The northern part has tiger, gaur, barasinga. Uh, the eastern part has got large herds of elephants even today. And the southern part in the dry area would be blackbird chinkara. But if you go further south in the wetter areas, then you will get gaur and elephant. The cultural landscape in this zone is so varied that we cannot really bring it all in here. But the western region, the local people used to grow wheat, maize, cotton. The eastern region was primarily rice. And many of the oldest rice varieties come from this belt in the east. The conservation again here is to sacred groves. And in the eastern part, people still grow new sacred groves of sal trees. This is very fascinating because Whereas in the Western Ghats, these were traditional old groves. Today, the tribal folk there will continue to plant a new grove. If somebody gets married or somebody has a celebration, they would plant a grove of sal trees. The seventh zone is the indo gangetic plain. This is the food bowl of India. It's always been so. In the Western part is drier, the Eastern part is more monsoonal. The natural vegetation is tropical, dry and moist deciduous forests. The flora is primarily sal in the east. And if you go further down, that's India's largest delta, the mangrove swamps of the Sundarbans. The fauna is a very wide range. In the drier areas, you get black bucket chinkara. In the wetter areas, you would get sambar and chital. And of course, there are patches with elephant even today. The cultural landscape is what is very fascinating because this is the earliest area where human beings started growing crops in our country. And this eastern paddy belt has got still large varieties of rice, which are not found anywhere else. The cattle grazing for this belt is something which is very important. It probably came in with the Aryans, it probably was there even before. And they here in this area use cattle dung as fertilizer for their crops. And therefore there's this very strong linkage between the cattle herder and the agriculturist. In fact, most of these communities are agro-pastoralists and therefore would depend very much on the cattle dung that they collect for fertilizing their crops. The indo gangetic Plains is where civilization really began in India. And if you think of the first 
urban civilizations. They occurred in this belt. And uh, you had the uh, city-states, which were along the Indus and the Sarawati River. And they were supported by agricultural land. So though they were city-states, their actual hinterland was what supported the economy of this place. And there was a lot of transport of goods and services between this region and the West. And this is something that was there even from the time of Mohenjo-daro and Harappa. So it is not something that was that came about much later. It is something that is very, very ancient in our country that we got these kind of influences. But we also had people coming in from abroad and uh, mixing cultures. So this was something that occurred in the indo gangetic plain earlier than anywhere else. A very special part of what we need to think about is what happened in the Central Highlands. As humans spread across the country of India, this little, small narrow belt across in the Central Highlands remained the traditional tribal lands of our country. And this is where these tribal people have very, very close links to nature because they are the ancient animistic cultures that actually started off the cultural process in India. The eighth zone is India's coastal belt. It goes right down the western coast, the eastern coast, and it has a wide variety of ecosystems. It has sandy beaches, rocky precipices on the, on the seashores, it has salt marshes, it has deltas of rivers uh, on the eastern side, much larger deltas, and it has vegetation which is primarily evergreen type of vegetation because these are mostly high monsoonal belts. So the flora is something that is dependent on monsoon and very often in the type of fauna depends on the length of the monsoon period in a particular area. The fauna is very special. It's got huge variety of estuarine birds and of course there are marine animals, there is fish, there are crustacea. There's this whole marine mammal fauna which we know so little about, the dolphin, the dugongs, the whales. The cultural landscape is really a very mixed community of paddy land farmers, coconut growers, cashew, whatever, arachnid, spices. But there's also the fisher folk. And they have lived together in those little communities all along. Whether they are fisher folk or farmers, they will live together in these cultural landscapes. And the traditions that they have preserved are very fascinating. If you go to Kerala, every little household in this belt will have a little grove in the back of their house in which there are supposed to be uh, preserved a certain level of snakes which they, would, uh, which they will not disturb. So this is the little patch of forest which is so very, very special. And since there are hundreds and thousands of these behind every household, this becomes a very important way of conserving biodiversity. The fisher folk of our coast are incredible people. They understand the biodiversity of their region extremely well. They're able to today tell you how their fish stocks are depleting because of trawling. They're able to tell you where the fish will be found in a particular season or in a particular time of the year. <clears throat> this is something that's very fascinating. They understand just by looking at the color of the sea, the waves, the way the breeze is blowing, and they know where to fish. And this is something that, that has been lost in terms of what they are able to do through their own traditional knowledge systems. The Northeast space states are something just very, very special. Uh, if you look at these seven states, each of them has a large number of tribal communities. They were always at war with each other in the past, but today they are they're, they're, they're all more or less integrated. But this tribal belt is something that is so important for us to conserve in India. They have enormous traditions of very, very great value to us today. They are complex communities and their linkage to biodiversity and nature is so very strong and so very dependent that we have to learn in the rest of our country from these people. This high flora and faunal endemicity is something which, which is delightful to go to. You walk through one of these forests and you're transported somewhere else and you realize how very beautiful our country is. There are high eleva uh, elevation evergreen forests and there are plains forests and 
This is just incredible diversity. And you have the one-horned rhinoceros, which was nearly disappeared. By the 50s, they were down to a dozen or so. And today, they are multiplying. We translocated some into other sanctuaries from the original home which they had. There's elephant, gaur, tiger, very rare, Manipur, brow and clear deer. So this is this enormous diversity that we have. But what fascinates me most is this, is this cultural aspect of this and how these foragers have today started shifting from their traditional Zoom type of agriculture into conserving patches of forest in their own communities. And, and this is something that is so relevant to the rest of India that we try to understand how their local community governance mechanisms are actually making conservation areas. And this is something that we all need to learn from. The last zone is our islands, the Andaman, Nicobar and Lakshadweep Islands. And uh, there are 325 islands. Uh, about 100 plus are considered to be sanctuaries. And uh, these are very, very fascinating areas. They are hotspots of biodiversity and uh, they have mainland subspecies and their own species which you find nowhere else in the world. The flora consists of over 2,200 species and the fauna of bird life, reptiles, insect life, inc incredible diversity. The cultural landscapes are primarily settlers from mainland. They are also fisher folks and farmers. But the local tribal foragers and fisher folk uh, who lived in isolated, very threatened communities uh, are very, very special foraging people. The, in summary, uh, we have tried to understand this enormous diversity in this small lecture. And uh, this is also about how biodiversity is used by local people. So it's about how foragers have traditionally hunted, how they have traditionally gathered plants, both medicinal plants and plants for food. It's about agriculture. It's about the hills and plains people, which we talk about in other sessions. It's about fisher folk. And it is about the artisans, the potters, the metal workers, the weavers, the bamboo craftsmen. I think we all need to appreciate how valuable biodiversity is. It's not always easy to quantify this in in the terms of rupees. We need to understand that it has multiple values, that it's important for our food resources, it's important for traditional medicine, which is now becoming so very much more important. It's important because of the services that are linked to this biodiversity. So all the forest services which you get, or all the riverine services you get, are all directly linked to the biological diversity of those ecosystems. This linkage is very, very important to appreciate. If we get this linkage, then we get a reason to want to protect it. And this is very important because each of us has a role to play in this. It's not something that governments need to do. It's not something that NGOs need to do. It's something that each of us has to do if we want our future generations to get this biological diversity for themselves. And so it is both inter and inter intragenerational equity that we need to produce in this field of biological diversity. It's a very, very diverse, multicultural, intercultural, interdisciplinary type of science. We need to understand it from social issues. We need to understand from ecological issues, from botanical and zoological issues. There are all these things which cause threat. I began this talk by saying, please remember that the world is still very beautiful and India is very, very special. And it's very special today because we have these species, this huge wealth that we have in species, which is also an economic wealth. And sometimes we forget that these cryptic species, which we don't know anything about, may actually have huge values for the future. Biodiversity is not something that you can learn about from one short session. It's something that you have to really read about. But it's also very important that you experience biodiversity. The experiential learning of biodiversity is what actually hooks people. And, and, and that's how 
biodiversity can be so can be served and conserved it's very important that you do a certain amount of reading there are lots of good material which uh, have been suggested to you in this in these programs but i personally believe that the only way you can do this is to personally experience biodiversity go to these protected areas go into a forest look at what happens in a river both look at the cleanest of rivers but also look at what human beings are doing to rivers which become polluted and what that how that affects our biological diversity today they they're all dependent on this biodiversity that we've been talking about and each zone therefore has this very special nature of its own and today we have to find ways to conserve that biodiversity for our future generations so thank you very much